Okay, here we are. Good morning. Uh, looking to start with uh, chapter 14 of Genesis. I believe that's where we left off, right? Cool. If memory serves me correctly. Do, 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 do. Lots of things in the news. Current events, as they say. What's that? Uh, what book was that? Why Revival Terry's? Good for you. Uh, why Revival Terry's? Oh, that is old school, uh, if you will, revival. The Jim has another book, uh, Praying for Revival. Revival praying. Yeah, same guy. It's, um, yeah, you just don't barrel through that book. It's uh, a book that, um, you know, take time to write. Anyway, good. Uh, you get an A. Your A is, your a is pending. <laughs> you too could get an A. <laughs> I used to, uh, we used to, whoever was teacher's pet got to clean the erasers. Did you have an eraser cleaner? Remember that? Oh, is that old school? Uh, okay. All right. Well, me being a spring chicken. Um, <laughs> no, I, I substituted uh, before COVID. I uh, took it was a substitute teacher here and there and uh, I went into the classroom and it's it's all electronic now it, uh, attendance everything and I'm like I, I don't know I don't know the setup so good luck kids <laughs> anyway let's pray and get into it thank you God father for for bringing us together and you know, gathering around your word as we gather around your word um, may your spirit open our hearts and minds to be able to hear and to begin to become aware of the greatness of your kingdom, of your truth, of your word, and of your very presence, which has called us out of the world to belong to you. And um, in so doing, may our lives be a living testimony of your goodness and your grace. And May it give glory to who you are. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Chapter 14 of Genesis. Now, Abraham and Lot have separated. One of the things that is, uh, well, we'll get into it in chapter 14. But chapter 13 is where they uh, separate. So then this brings us to chapter 14. Let's go in and, and read it right now, shall we? At this time... I'll take Amraphel, king of Shinar. The plain of Shinar is where the Tower of Babel was, if you remember. Uh, Babylonia. Very important. All these places are very important. They, they may not look to be important as you read it over, but it's, it's important with regards to uh, what's taking place. So um, Amraphel king of Shinar, Ariat, king of Elisar, Kedolamar, king of Elam, and Tidal, king of Goyim, went to war. So you got one, two, three, uh, four kings went to war against Bera, king of Sodom. This is where, um, where Lot is. Birsha, king of Gomorrah, Shinab, king of Adma, Shemaber, king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, that is Zoar. All these latter kings joined forces in the Valley of Sidim, the Salt Sea, uh, I have as a footnote as well, or that is the Dead Sea. So they're in this area uh, just, just east of, uh, of, 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 of Israel, later Israel. The 12 years, for 12 years rather, they had been subject to Kedal Amar, but in the 13th year, they rebelled, the 13th. So in the 14th year, in order to crush this rebellion, 
Kedar el Amir and the kings allied with him went out and defeated the Raphites. That's an important group. We'll get to that later. In Ashtoreth, Karnaim, the Zuzites in Ham, the Amorites in Shavah, Kiriathim, and the Horites in the hill country of Seir, as far as El Paran near the desert. Then they turned back and went to El Mishpat, that is Kadesh, and they conquered the whole territory of the Amalekites, as well as the Amorites who were living in Hazazan Tamar. All these we'll get back to later. You can just kind of put them in your file as it, you know, places that we'll, we'll come back to that are important. Not all of them, but many of them. Then the king of Sodom, the king of Gomorrah, the king of At Adma, the king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, that is, or marched out and drew up their battle lines in the valley of Sedim against, those are the five, Kedilamar, king of Elam, Tidal, king of Goyim, Amraphel, king of Shinar, and Ariok, king of Allah. Four kings against five. Now the valley of Sedim was full of tar pits, and when the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled, some of them fell into them, and the rest fled to the hills. The four kings seized all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their food, then they went away. They also carried off Abraham's nephew Lot and his possession since he was living in Sodom. One who had escaped came and reported this to Abraham the Hebrew. This becomes a, Hebrew becomes a uh, derogatory term. Um, Hebrew becomes a way of, well, they're not, it was just Abraham and his family. But later the descendants and so forth are, are, are it's a, it's a, it's a term of contempt, if you will. Later on, when Joseph goes down to Egypt, serves the king, uh, is accused of rape. The accuser says of him, and this Hebrew that you brought in raped me. So it's, it's a derogatory term. Um, we continue on. Uh, again, verse 13, one who had escaped came and reported this to Abraham the Hebrew. Abraham was living near the great trees of Mamre, the Amorite, a brother of Eskel and Aner, all of whom were allied with Abraham. When Abraham heard that his relative had been taken captive, he called out the 318 trained men born in his household and went in pursuit as far as Dan. During the night, Abraham divided his men to attack them, and he routed them, pursuing them as far as Hobah, north of Damascus. He recovered all the goods and brought back his relative Lot and his possessions together with the women and the other people. After Abraham returned from defeating Kedilamar and the kings allied with him, the king of Sodom came out to meet him in the valley of Sheba, that is the king's valley. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, later becomes Jerusalem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of Elohim, God Most High. And he blessed Abraham, saying, Blessed be Abraham by God Most High, creator of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who delivered your enemies into your hand. Then Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. The king of Sodom said to Abraham, Give me the people and keep the goods for yourself. But Abraham said to the king of Sodom, I have raised my hand to the Lord. He doesn't know his name at this time. This is obviously brought in later because that word, all capital, was given in terms of the name was given to Moses. Nonetheless, it was to that God, God Most High, creator of heaven and earth, and have taken an oath that I will accept nothing belonging to you, not even a thread or the thong of a sandal, so that you will never be able to say, I made Abraham rich. I will accept nothing but what my men have eaten and the share that belongs to the men who went with me to Anor, Eskel, and Mamre. Let them have their share. So, this is an important uh, chapter doesn't maybe on the surface appear to be, but in incredibly important. Abraham has been called in chapter 12. In chapter 11, you have the tower of what's called Babel, where the 
the nations that had come out of the flood, or the, the family that came out of flood were dispersed, and in chapter 11, rejected God and tried to pursue on their own merit or, or from their own resources, from their own being. They're going to create the bridge, if you will, between heaven and earth. They will do that. And God disinherited them. We read, we read that in the Psalms. Um, that Well, we read it primarily in Deuteronomy 32, I believe, when, when Moses is given a history. Because he's talking directly to the Israelites. You are all here. You are a great nation. We're going into this place. But remember how we got here? And remember the context of why we even exist in the first place. We are the Lord's. And wherever we're going, we will meet against, we will come against and meet people that do not serve the Lord. They may decide to, but this is a hostile land we are going into. They will not give it up. The gods of this land will not give it up easily. And if you go, whether it's the book of Judges, book of Kings, it's this constant struggle between being faithful to the Lord and being pulled into the worship of other deities. These, and, and, and again, the backstory is important. We talked about that um, in terms of the rebellion that took place uh, in the spiritual realm and who these deities are. So, so after the nations have gone their own way, they have different languages, um, God has given them over to lesser, if you will, uh, gods, and, and, and you see this happen all over the, the, the area of the, of, of the Middle East and worldwide, a, God chooses one person out of Babylon, out of Babylonia. I'm going to cho- my, Abraham will be my inheritance. That's in chapter 12. Chapter 13, he is so blessed in the material world that there's not enough room for him to be, to, 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 to live, coexist with Lot. They separate. And in chapter 14, the blessing of Abraham as God's chosen goes with him. And so Lot being captured is, an, is the setup for God to demonstrate this is the first time that I am with, I the Lord am with this person and I will protect him, I will bless him. Wherever he goes, I go. And God has a priest, it's a foreshadowing if you will, in Salem, which later becomes Jerusalem, the city. And blesses, he's already beginning to make his name great, the Lord is, by blessing Abraham and telling Abraham he is blessed. And in so doing, invokes the name of the Lord that will become a prominent way of life. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Um. Who was I listening to? Oh, Michael Savage had a heart attack, and he's Jewish. And he said, when I was in the hospital, that's what I kept on. That was the sheep. Hear, O, hear, o Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. The Lord. And, and it's, 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 it's a little challenging for us to, to, to comprehend how, how striking that is. Because in every other culture, it doesn't matter what culture you study historically. They had what we call a pantheon of gods. Have you heard that term before? Pan- Many gods. A pantheon. So in the Greek gods, you had you know, the, the main god, you had lesser gods, and so on and so forth. But they were all kind of, um, they all lived and dwelt among their 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 mountain, Mount um, Olympus, whatever Mount Hermon, 
we're going to get to in a bit. Um, and the Lord then is breaking into this world and saying, no, blessed be Abraham by God most high, the creator of heaven and earth. They did not create a single thing. He is reclaiming, if you will, his, his name. There is no, there's no other name under heaven by which a man can. And this plays through in the New Testament so profoundly. Paul says it. There is no other name under heaven by which a man can be saved. And it's not a formulaic thing. Uh, it's, not, it's not just a formula like an incantation. If you say the right words, it will happen. He's taught, this is, Jesus is the fulfillment of everything that God had been doing in the Old Testament for thousands of years, which is, I will make my name great. Jesus says, shortly before, um, oh, Turn with me to the Gospel of John, please. And we're going to go to a uh, later chapter. Um, uh, let's see. Let's go to uh, chapter 17. Chapter 17 of, of, of John. After Jesus said this, and after he goes through this discourse, then he gets arrested. So this is, this is following three chapters of, of him talking to his disciples. But in chapter 17, after Jesus said this, he looked toward heaven, which is where God, just looking into the heavenly realm, which he could see. He said previously, I don't do it... Um, I tell you the truth, a son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees his father doing um, because the son does what the father does. So in chapter 17, he looks toward heaven and prayed, Father, the time has come. Glorify your son that your son may glorify you for you granted him authority over all people. And he's continuing to... to um, This, this continuation of giving God glory that the other forces, spiritual forces, are trying to put a damper on, to, 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 to steal his glory from. Um, there are another one. Um, oh, let's see, where is that? Uh, Father, glorify your name. I have glorified it. We'll glorify it again. Um, Let's see if that's okay. This in a, in a previous chapter, chapter twelve, Jesus says, uh, "Let's just go there for a second. Chapter twelve, verse twenty-seven is another example. Chap same same book, John. Mm -hmm. Verse twenty-seven, yeah. Chapter twelve, verse twenty-seven." He says, now my heart is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No. It was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. You should have that in there. Name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and will glorify it again. The crowd that was there and heard it said it had thundered. Others said an angel had spoken to him. So this is a continuation. He is making his name great again. As he's been doing all through and what, was, and, and what he had intended to do through the creation of Israel is to make his name great. Part of the fourth commandment, um, is to remember the Sabbath. Very important commandment. It's not, it, it doesn't carry with it so much of a moral application as it does a witness application. 
if you have a nation that moves in and every single Saturday, if you will, the seventh day, they don't work, whereas everybody else does, you will prompt question, why aren't you working? Oh, we don't work because the Lord, our God, the creator of heaven and earth. It goes all the way back to the very first chapter in Genesis. He rested on the Sabbath, therefore, to remember him by and that he is the creator of the earth, we too take the Sabbath and we keep it holy. We separate it. We, like him, do no work. It's a living testimony. It's another way of witnessing to the nations around them. Oh, your God... Tell me more about this, God. And so what is taking place in chapter 14 of Genesis that we just read is God reclaiming what had been subversively taken from him, meaning who we are as human beings and all of his creation. It It was stolen, but deceivedly taken from him. So let's go back to to Genesis 14. This is what's taking place here in chapter 14. It is a earmark, and we're going to get to some of the the, the background story later on with to who these people were, um, whether they are the the, the Raphites or or another, another group that we'll get to later. All right, so this is what's taking place in chapter 14. You you, you get a glimpse of God's choosing Abraham to work through Abraham for a very specific purpose, and then he he gives it, not someone gives an example, but he demonstrates. Remember, all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless those who bless you. This actually is a demonstration of that. Which now brings us to chapter 15. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. But Abram said, O sovereign Lord, what can you give me? since I remain childless, and the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, You have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. Then the word of the Lord came to him, This man will not be your heir, but a son coming from your own body will be your heir. He took him outside and said, look up at the heavens and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. Abraham believed the Lord and he credited to him as righteousness. He also said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to take possession of it. But Abraham said, O sovereign Lord, how can I know that I will gain possession of it? So the Lord said to him, Bring me a heifer, a goat, and a ram, each three years old, along with a dove and a young pigeon. Abraham brought all these to him, cut them in two, and arranged the halves opposite each other. The birds, however, did not cu- he did not cut in half. Then birds of prey came down in the carcasses, but Abram drove them away. As the sun was setting, Abram fell into a deep sleep, and a thick and dreadful darkness came over him. Then the Lord said to him, now I want to, before we go on any further, I want to point out something. There's no separation 
between the word of the Lord and the Lord. And as we read through Genesis, we're going to see how Hero Israel, the Lord your God, and the Lord is one. The Lord is one, but he takes on and can take on um, different manifestations of himself, if you will. We're going to see later on where he comes to Abraham in the form of a human being. And two angels as well. Talks with them. It's not the first time that... Eight, that, that the Lord will take on, be, you know, flesh, if you will. It's already setting the stage, if you will, for Jesus, but that's down the road. For, for now, the word of the Lord and the word is one. There's no separation. That's why Jesus can say, don't you believe? Um, from now on, if you really knew me, you would know the Father. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. And then Philip says, Lord, just show us the Father. That'll be enough. And Jesus' response is, don't you know me, Philip? Even after I've been with you for all this time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. Um, believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me or at least believe on the evidence of the miracles themselves. Um, and, 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 and he talks about the words that I say to you are not just my own. It is the Father living in me who is doing his work. His word is inseparable from his very being. Sometimes we can use that in our own vernacular when we say things like, a man is only as good as his word. If you're, or, and they, they, they follow it through in the, in the New Testament, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Jesus says, don't swear by anything in heaven or by anything on earth below. Don't use manipulation. Your yes, what you say is as good as as who you are. They're in what you bind in heaven, you bind on earth. What you loose in heaven, you loose on earth. There's this connection, there's this understanding that the word of the Lord is one with him. That's why it is very confusing, confusion, confusing when people do not, when they're deceiving and their words do not match their intention because this is where you this is how we should be if you will we, we should emulate the Lord being his image bearers but for right now this is important to understand as we go through I'll point it out more and more the word of the Lord came to him and then later on um, in verse 13 the Lord said to him first few verses the word of the Lord came and you're going to see this happen in the New Testament. And the word of the Lord came to Zechariah. Oh. Now, if you know the New Old Testament, it, you, okay, one and the same. Let's take a look at what he says in verse 13. Know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own. And they will be enslaved and mistreated. 400 years, but I will punish the nation they serve as slaves, and afterward they will come out with great possessions. You, however, will go to your fathers in peace and be buried at a good old age. In the fourth generation, your descendants will come back here, for the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. Now, what he's doing. Now, let's just finish this. When the sun had set and darkness had fallen, a smoking fire pot with a blazing torch appeared and passed between the pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham and said, To your descendants I give this land from the river of Egypt 
to the great river, the Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, Kenizzites, Cadmonites, Hittites, Perizzites, Raphites, Amorites, Canaanites, Gergesites, and Phobites. If you don't, if you start running out of air, you just got to go faster. So that, that's that's the covenant there. So what he's doing, a few things that are taking place. First of all, what 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 is this? This is an ancient model of ratifying a treaty. If a lot is at stake, the more important things become, the more we have ways of ratifying it. So, hey, I'll see you tomorrow. Tomorrow, 1030, cool, great. It's important, but okay, tomorrow, I'll bring the car that I'm gonna sell you, you bring the cash. It's a little bit more important, okay, good. We do this. Handshake. Handshake is an old, it's, it's, I don't have anything to stab you with. It goes back a long ways. Okay. Handshake is like, no, I'm not going to kill you. I'm, well, you do this constantly. I do this all the time if you have pets. Everyone have any pets? You just come on. You don't go up to him. Hey, hey, hey. You know, just, especially if it's David Rogers' dog. You know, it's just, holy shit. That thing's a, that's a, that's a serious dog he's got there. Um, and you go up like this, and then the dog smells you, and okay. Um, the same thing. That's more serious. Then if you get even more serious, I need your, I need your, I need your hand, your, your signature, an extension of your word. You get a copy. I get a copy. It's called a receipt. That's what the Ten Commandments are. God gets Ten Commandments. He gets a copy. He puts it in the, the, the ark. Israel gets a copy. There's two copies. So, because God's entering into a treaty with a nation. Here, this is a way of saying, this is the, a customary way of saying, we're making a treaty. And the way that you would make the treaty is everything is cut in half. You walk halfway through and say, I vow or I pledge or whatever it is that I'm committing to. And if I don't follow through on my commitment, may I be like one of these that has been severed. And then I back out and then the other party does the same thing. And that's exactly what happens here. God shows up in physical form in what they describe as a smoking fire pot with a blazing torch. There's always some kind of blazing, some kind of fire. Whether it's the Holy Spirit with tongues and fire, whether it's God coming down on Mount Sinai with fire, whether it's God coming down because Elijah is asking him to come down and consume the set. There's always fire involved of some kind. Whether it's uh, Ezekiel or Daniel or going up and seeing God and it's, there's uh, the brilliance of him. So this is the, this is the, cultural norm for creating and ratifying commitments, treaties, if you will, which makes sense because they just got done making a treaty. You stay, you stay loyal to me, I will bless you. So this is how th this plays out. In addition to that, he says, no, for certain this, this is, I'm going to give you a piece. This is Something that God does. Depending on how faithful you are, God will show you things based in part on your ability or maturity or character of being faithful to him. So Abraham, in the previous chapter, goes to war, to rescue, is faithful to his God, does not offer sacrifices to the other gods, and as such, demonstrate a level of faithfulness that God now shows him a little bit more, reveals a little bit more. Jesus does this with his disciples constantly. It's only after a period of time that he sends out 70 in his name to do what he's been doing. But, he, and, but and, and he's doing this all the time. He's, it, it, it can almost come across in the New Testament, as if he's, as if he's uh, scorning them. He's not scorning them. For example, um, Peter says, "If it's you, Lord, 
tell me to come out on the water. All right, let's do it. Come on out. And he does, and then, you know, like anybody else uh, that gets afraid, it starts, starts going down, picks him up. Okay, well, you have little faith. You're getting there. You're getting, you're not there yet, but good for you. Because there's a lot of people that wouldn't even got out of the boat. It's easy to read into it. Oh, you of little faith. Why aren't you? No, no, that's not God. God is constantly working with us, not against us, and is encouraging us. He is the encourager. He's the comforter. He is the advocate. You can do it. You can do it. Um, great is thy faithfulness. Your presence to cheer and to guide. I think it's the third verse. I love that. Your presence to cheer, to cheer us on, and to guide. And so in this, in this chapter, he starts to give, God does, he gives Abraham a glimpse. Now he says two things, three things that are very important. First of all, when you take a look at it, Know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own. They will be enslaved and mistreated 400 years. And he couples that with, But I will punish the nation they serve as slaves, and afterward they will come out with great possessions. You, however, will go to your fathers in peace and be buried at a good old age. In the fourth generation, your descendants will come back here. So he couples this with the fourth generation. Now the generation, in terms of what um, defines a generation, is always defined by how old the father is when their firstborn son comes into the world. That's a generation for them. We don't have it like the 60s and the 70s. Those are social generations. And there's some, you know, identifying qualities to that. But in this particular culture, a generation is defined by the age of the father when his firstborn son comes into the world. Anyone remember how old Abraham was when Isaac was born? 100. So he couples this together. And even if you're off by a year or so, that's, they, don't, they don't care about that. We care about that. But in other words, he's giving him an insight as to what's going to take place. What difference does it make to him? He's not going to be around. Yeah, but this promise continues on to my prodigy. It's not about me. It's about something much bigger than me that God is doing, that will continue to do. And this will be passed down to my son. My son will pass, down, pass it down to his son. His son will pass it down to their sons, etc. So that by the time Israel is in Egypt, what they still have as a, as a glimmer of hope is that God is making us into a great nation. And even in the, in the face of being enslaved, look what God is doing. Yes. Firstborn son. Yeah. Firstborn son. Now, this is chapter 15. Very important chapter because God also appears physically again, this time as uh, some kind of pot of, of, of fire within it. And they ratify the treaty in a cultural norm of the time. This now brings us to chapter 16. So, um, okay. Chapter 16. Now, Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, but she had an Egyptian maidservant named Hagar, so she said to Abram, the Lord has kept me from having children. Go sleep with my maidservant. Perhaps I can build a family through her. Abram agreed to what Sarai said. So Abram 
So after Abraham had been living in Canaan 10 years, he, uh, yeah, after Abraham had been living in uh, in Canaan 10 years, Sarah, his wife, took her Egyptian maidservant Hagar and gave her to her husband to be his wife. He slept with Hagar and she conceived. When she knew she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress. Then Sarai said to Abram, you are responsible for the wrong I am suffering. I put my servant in your arms, and now that she knows she is pregnant, she despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. Your servant is in your hands, Abram said. Do with her whatever you think best. Then Sarai mistreated Hagar, so she fled from her. The angel of the Lord found her, found Hagar near a spring in the desert. It was the spring that is beside the road to Shur. And he said, Hagar, servant of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? I am running away from my mistress, Sarai. Sarai, she answered. Then the angel of the Lord told her, go back to your mistress and submit to her, the angel added. I will so increase your descendants that they will be too numerous to count. All right. Now, in the same way that the word of the Lord cannot be separated from the Lord himself, so the angel of the Lord. This is the beginning of this. Look at how it's played out. Look at how it's written out. It's written out intentionally. Um, This is verse 7. The angel of the Lord. Angel... Um, in Hebrew simply means messenger in the same way that angel in Greek means messenger. can be human, um, but more likely it refers to an Elohim. But it's the, the lower echelon, if you will. It's not like an archangel or um, a thing like that. Nonetheless, in verse 7, the angel of the Lord found Hagar. And in verse 8, he said, the angel, Hagar, servant, etc. Then in verse 9, the angel of the Lord told her, so he's speaking to her, and this is what he says, I will so increase your descendants that they will be too numerous to count. That's God. So they're inseparable. The name, the word, and the angel, inseparable. Still not a Godhead, but inseparable from the Lord. The Lord is not restricted, if you will. It's a forerunner of how, especially when they come out of Egypt, where God says, I will put my angel in front of you to go before you, and I will go before you. There's an inseparability there. Um, the angel, this is verse 11, said to her, You are now with child, and you will have a son. You shall name him Ishmael, which means, again, anything that ends with the letter E-L is the lowercase Lord. Um, This one means the Lord hears. For the Lord has heard of your misery. He will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone and everyone's hand against him. And he will live in hostility toward all his brothers. She gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. You are the Elohim, God, who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. That is why the well was called Bir Lahai Roy. It is still there between Kadesh and Bered. So Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram gave the name Ishmael to the son she had born. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore him Ishmael. So he's 75 when he leaves, just as a, as a footnote. I believe this is in chapter 12. Uh, can't see it off the top of my head. And if I could see it, I'd have to take my glasses off. But uh, he's, 80, he's, he's, 
He's 86 now. He w was in uh, Canaan for 10 years. All right. Um, so he's 86. Now, this begins to, there's conflict here, as you can see in, in chapter 16. Because while the Lord gave Abraham certain promises, he fell into what Eve did, which is, I will take now matters into my own hands to accomplish his promises. He gave me promises, but he needs a little help. And in so doing, it would steal from God's glory. No, this is all an act of my doing. I will do it completely. There's no way that you are going to be able to say in the manner that I'm going to bring this about that I did it because Sarai cannot get pregnant. It won't be the last time. We do the same thing with Samuel, Samuel's mother, and ultimately with Mary. So it's not something that originates with humanity. It originates with God. God alone gets the glory in this. But in taking that step without God, remember, now this is very important. Who did Abraham listen to? After? God gives, going back, God gives instruction to Adam. Don't eat of the tree. That's the don't. Everything else is, we're going to do this together, name this together, name this animal. Name. They're having a great time. They're doing, they're doing what they were created to do. When you do something that you're created to do, there's, it's just, it's joy. Yeah. Uh, you know, you don't have a duck try to make milk. It'd be very frustrating, you know. Um, but have the thing fly around. It's, it's happy as a clam. Um, so, but through Eve, Adam decides to eat. Abraham is given promises. Through Sarai, he decides to take matters into his own hands. It's not a judgment on any kind of men versus woman thing. It's a pattern that will continue to take place as we see. Solomon was given a great kingdom, but his 300 wives led the country into idolatry. But there's a, we'll, we'll get to Again, it's not a slam on any kind of gender thing. It's just a, a pattern to, to remember by. All right. Any questions on chapter 16? Okay. When Abram was now 99 years old, this is 13 years later. Where is he 75? Uh, was it at the end of it? Chapter 12, I know, but I didn't see it. I know he's 75. I read it. I cannot see it now. Is it four? Yeah, there you go. Thank you. Good eyes. Eagle eyes. So he's 75 there. He is um, 86, 10 years she gets pregnant, has a kid. He's 86. Now he's 99. This is 13 years later. The Lord appeared to him and said, I am Elohim Almighty, God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. Now this is not, again, it's very important to not confuse morality although it's extremely important, with faithfulness. 
you can't uncouple them. But remember, David was someone who took another man's wife, slept with her, then killed the man who was the woman's husband and tried to cover it up and is still considered a man after God's own heart. Because faithfulness, they work in tangent, but faithfulness to God is is another issue as compared to being morally pure. God will not expect us to be morally pure. We can't. We're in sin. We're in this world. What he expects us to do with that impurity is lay it before him, receive his forgiveness, learn from it, and go on. So being faithful is faithful to him. Not necessarily a a morality issue, although it will include morality because as the kings of Israel found out or more specifically, the king of kings of Judah as well. When you turn away from God, you do horrific things. It's not, however, as the society will teach us, well, if, oh, look at what they did, and they're a Christian. Look, Christians are going to mess up. That's not the issue. The issue is how we're living our lives as we're messing up. The morality that's involved. I mean, Peter denied Jesus three times. Three times. Paul, my goodness, went out and tried to kill Christians. So, morality is interwoven, but it's not the same when we talk about faithfulness. So, now in verse chapter 17, Abraham is now 99 years old. The Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. We are one. You do not turn away from me. I will confirm my covenant between me and you and will will greatly increase your numbers. Abraham fell face down and God said to him, as for me. Now the Lord appeared to him. So he's whatever form he takes, he is there. Abraham fell face down and God said to him, as for me, this is my covenant with you. You will be the father of many nations. No longer, sometimes that's, that's um, overlooked. Because he's not the father of many nations yet, and he's not the father of many nations during the time of Israel. He becomes the father of many nations through the Messiah, who brings all nations back together. I was listening, like, I think I said this last week to Dennis Prager, who's, a devout Jew, not a Christian. There's some theological differences there, to be sure. But he said, as he was quoting a rabbi, Christianity has done more to bring the world to the Torah than the Jews ever have. And that's true. I mean, maybe not anymore, but we used to have the Ten Commandments in front of courthouses and things of that nature. That's not because Jews, because of Christians adopting the God of the Jews. So, and this is always part of it. I will make you into a nation. So the promise is that this is God's redemption. From you will come a great nation. Nation has to have certain things to it. We'll get to that later. But the purpose of this nation is to bring to back to God All nations. This has always been the purpose of Israel as God chose them and as God enacted his plan of redemption. And when you take a look, when you, we'll go back, not right now, but we'll go back at some point when the nations were dispersed and the Tower of Babel took place as God 
demonstrates his power at Pentecost, he reverses it. He goes to all those places where Noah's sons had, after the flood, settled. They went this way. They started in where, where Noah uh, left off the um, Ararat. Went this way. And, and Paul, the Apostle Paul, does the same thing. Remember at the end of Paul's life, the Apostle, he was so, I need to get, he never, we don't know if he got through the book of Acts, but remember where, where his end game was? Spain. Spreading this out. He understood that through Jesus the Messiah, God was fulfilling all of his plan that he enacted and is enacting through Abraham right now. So I will be the father of many nations. No longer will you be called Abraham. Your name will be Abraham, for I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you very fruitful. I will make nations of you and kings will come from you. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for the generations to come to be your God, your God, and the God of your descendants after you. The whole land of Canaan, wherever, I'm sorry, where you are now an alien, I will give as an everlasting possession to you and your descendants after you and I will be their God, which means as he gives later on all this land, he has to and does expel all of the Elohim that are in the land that are set against God, whether it's the gods of the Philistines, the Amorites, the Malachites, um, the Edom, I mean, all of them. And, uh, and we'll see how how this takes place as we go on uh, through the scripture. All right. Um, any any questions before we? Is this you get the bigger picture? So when you when you go to like a university class or whatever, well, yeah, that's that. But what about what happened in Asia? Same thing. This is the known world of the time. But Asia, they all went after pagan gods. They all have snakes and birds and and everything else. Um, so this is, this is a world view of what the creator of, of, our, of the world is working through history and is even working today through us, through you. That's a good point. Um. I was going to, uh, my phone is in my thing. What I do for that, when I'm curious about that, I just go in and put in nation or nations, see when it first popped up. I think it will be because they talked about kings. And um, kings have territory, um, but the understanding of a nation state, and I will punish the nation. What did he say? Uh, you mean in this chapter? Yeah, so the nation, the nations as they are here, let's take a look at uh, Egypt, are run by a family, meaning the fair, in the same way that Saudi Arabia is. It's a nation run by one family. Yeah. Um, and, and, and God uses this term with David. Someone from your house will always be on the throne. Your family. That's why it can kind of sound odd to us, like, no, he's the family I've chosen because he's been the only one that's been faithful. Oh, he hasn't been perfect. I don't mean, fa I don't mean faithful in a moral sense. I mean faithful in a covenant sense. And because of his faithfulness, I rewarded him. He will always have a king on the throne. His house. So now, as God is, is, is pronouncing that, the Messiah has to come from his house, from his lineage, because God made that promise, that commitment, and God is always faithful. 
then change his mind. So we'll, we'll get into that more and more um, as we go through. Okay, I wanted to um, share two minutes, I think. Maybe you've been abreast as to um, what's happening in the collegiate world of swimming. And I wanted to, this is one of the best books, The Making of the Modern University, goes into the, the, the history of the university and how it has shifted in terms, specifically in terms of its morality and its teaching of it. And just to remind ourselves, in 1905, a group of colleges and universities agreed to form the National Collegiate Athletic Association. Why? Because Christianity, religion in particular, was no longer being taught, and so they didn't have a moral curriculum. And so, I'll just do a quote. One coach in particular, I'll give you an example. At the time that university leaders exonerated the conduct of intercollegiate athletics, they insisted that athletics had important moral benefits. University of Chicago's famous football coach, Amos Alonzo Stagg, frequently spoke of the moral value of college sports. Athletics, Stagg asserted, quote, employs leisure in wholesome and beneficial ways, takes a man's mind and directs it along wholesome lines, and keeps it off the unwholesome. It curtails his animal spirits as to stop expression in explosive ways that are immoral, end quote. Stagg maintained that he had opted for a career in coaching rather than the ministry because he believed he could have stronger moral influence as a coach. The controversy now is, while there was men's sports and women's sports, you have an athlete that is biologically male, identifies as a female, and is taking all the, the trophies away. And it's, it's, it's come into conflict, and it bleeds into, well, it bleeds, bleeds into the Supreme Court nominee, who, when asked, could you define a woman, could not, did not do it. Did not do it. And I had, didn't see the entirety of it. I saw clips. One of the clips I did see is, well, I'm not a biologist, which is an interesting thing because one of the arguments is biology doesn't dictate our identity. We do. We can identify as whatever we want to or feel that we are, regardless of our biology. So there's not, it's very confusing. Um, I'll just leave that with you to work it out. Um, Anyway, and it's obviously in our denomination as well. Well, now you had two minutes of current events. Thank you, Father, for, for your word today um, and teaching us and revealing to us how good you are, how faithful you are in your ultimate plan of salvation, not only for us individually, but of this world and of this universe. May we continue to walk with you as Abraham did, by your spirit, growing in our love for you, our trust for you, and our love for your people and your world that you have. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a great day. Thank you. 